Jeremy Weiss here live from IRCE. We're here with Jason, one of the co-founders of Bold. And Jason, uh, I want to hear how this all came together. I know this started in a basement, yeah. all right? But uh, where did this all start? Sure. Well, so uh, I had run online stores since 1998. So hopefully that really does. doesn't date me too much. So um, what, in 19, what did it look like in 1998? So I, I, my family had a sporting goods store, a retail store that, that I grew up working in since I was 13. And I started selling products that we sold in the store online. Uh, it was actually paintball guns and sporting goods equipment like backpacks and hiking gear and stuff like that. So I would sell that online. Uh, as part of the store, it, it got to a point in around 2008 where I was selling more online than we're, we were in the store, so I made it its own company. Um, and that was what I did for four years and then moved one of the sites onto Shopify. And long story short, Shopify had an app store and I wanted an app for my store. And uh, so partnered up with three other friends to build that app and then- you wanted to grow sales at the time and you did not see anything out there that would do that. Correct, and at the time, so this is around 2010, Shopify was, was still in their early days, like they kind of started around 2008. So there was maybe like 60 or 70 apps in the app store. It wasn't, it's, it wasn't like what it, what it is today. Um, so pretty much everything you wanted to do, you, you just had a wish list of apps. So the first app that I wanted for my store was a product comparison app. So you, you can pick a few different products and like compare features. Uh, and so we didn't end up building that, we ended up building an upsell app instead. Uh, just because we thought that would be easier. Uh, turned out, I mean, we're still developing that app today, five, five years later. Like, just keep at, like, you know, now it uses AI and machine learning yeah. to make the upsells and everything else. But it's, uh, that, that was our original goal. Like, just to, let's try this, put it in our own stores, and uh, go from there. So I want to talk about the co-founders for a second, but talk about some of the apps that you have. And um, then I want to circle back to the upsell app what the beginning version was and after. So talk about some of the apps you have now. Sure, so um, we make we, we develop apps really with how do we make merchants more money. Um, and that's just from being a merchant, that's just the way we think. So like all, none of our apps are integration apps. Like there's apps that integrate with you know shipping companies and things like that. Ours are, they all live on the front end of the store. You want to increase sales, this is what it's for. Right, so, so Upsell was the first one. Uh, one of our really big ones is a subscriptions app. So if you want to run subscriptions on your Shopify store, um, we have loyalty points apps, we have wholesale pricing apps. Um, you know, if you want to do bundles, quantity breaks, store locator, it's all like very front facing to help stores sell more. Flash sales, daily deals, um, like those types of apps. Yep. So, um, so early version of Upsell yeah. versus what it looks like now. The early version was just the merchant had to pick a product that would be offered when another product was sold. Very basic and not super scalable. So like if you had 10,000 products, it wasn't really practical to map them. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and it only triggered on the checkout button. So when you would click, uh, when you're in the cart, you click checkout, the upsell offer would come up. So it's evolved a ton. You can now trigger it all kinds of places throughout the, uh, throughout the journey, like whether it's on adding to cart, at the checkout, or even after checkout, which is actually the highest converting upsell because the customer's already paid. Uh, they've committed to buying from you. Uh, and then it's just a one click. Do you want to add this to your cart? Yes, it adds. It uses the same payment info. Uh, and then about a year and a half ago, we started building a product called the Bold Brain, which uses machine learning to make all of our apps smarter. So now that same store that has 18,000 products can install upsell with the brain and just say, make my upsell smart. Mm. And it creates all the upsells for the store based off of data of what sells best together. And a lot of times wow. uh, store owners think they know what the best products to go together. But when, they, when we actually look at the orders, it's, it's different. So it uses just the data to create the highest converting upsells for those store. Um, and that's, that's been huge for stores, just using. That sounds 
not impossible, really hard to create yeah. a bold brand. Yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it started as uh, we have what we call hack days at Bold, where we give our staff a couple days to um, just work on anything. And so one of the groups, it was about six guys, uh, they wanted to build this. At that time, I don't think we were calling it the brain. We were just calling it like Bold AI or something like that. And they're like, what if we used machine learning to make all of our apps smarter? So uh, obviously, Upsell made the most sense to start, but it, it integrates with all of our apps. So like for loyalties, for example, if you have uh, 10,000 loyalty points, uh, we used to just email you saying, hey, here's how many points you have, here's a bunch of things you can buy, and it was just random. Now we can email you saying, hey, you have 10,000 points, here's a bunch of things you can buy, but it's all based off of what you bought before and the highest odds of you being of converting matching, and, yeah. and matching. So, um, and then there's other touch points that integrates with all of other apps too. So we're basically trying to make it so a merchant can install an app and have next to no friction to get it running. Uh, and if we can remove all of that, that's ideal. Or if we can remove at least most of it. Uh, so how often do you have the hackathons? So we used to do it twice a year. We just made it now three times a year because we had such good products come out of them. So um, one of the big ones, uh, we, a multi-currency app was one that we did at a hackathon. Uh, you know, our merchants wanted to be able to charge in, so not just display different currencies, but actually charge in different currencies. So they built a way to swap out the payment gateway based off of which currency they select. That was a hack, hack day project. And at, when it's a hack day project, it's like very, very bare bones. And then, you yeah. know, we spent maybe three like months. Minimum viable product. Exactly, yeah. It doesn't have to look pretty. It just has to work and prove the concept. Uh, so a lot of our products have come out of these hack days. So we actually added another one just because of that. Yeah. It's amazing. Entrepreneur, you do more of what works. We often don't do that. Um, right. So how do you run the hack day? Is it like a 24-hour thing? What does it look like? Uh, it's 48 hours. We start Thursday morning. We have, a, we have opening ceremonies at 7.30, and uh, it goes all through the night on Thursday, and a lot of people like don't sleep, They, or if they sleep for like three hours on a couch somewhere, uh, it's all you can drink, Red Bull and pizza through the night, but Friday at three is presentations, nice. and everyone gets, I think it's 90 seconds or two minutes, uh, depending on how many there are, but to, to show what they built, uh, and then we afterwards, about a couple weeks later, we go through every single one and be like, okay, what should we keep? What should we, like, some of them are completely un unrelated to products. Like this last one, one guy noticed that there was lineups one day at our bathroom, so he built a laser sensor in all of the stalls. So like, instead of you getting up and going and seeing that the bathroom's being used, you can go to our internal website and go, oh, okay, bathroom's being used, I'll wait. Oh, it's free, I'll go. So like, some of them are just company fun improvement things. One guy built a robotic sandwich maker, we've got, Oh um, you know, like there's stuff like that, and then there's products for our merchants too. So it's a little bit of everything. It's it's just fun. That's cool. So talk about culture. Yeah. You guys have grown, and even on your site, you show kind of the um, the timeline of growth. So talk about the kind of that growth of employees, and then how you, as you grow, you keep that culture because it sounds like you guys have a tight knit culture. Yeah, I think um, early on we just wanted to make a good product, and they're became a point that we realized as like four owners that we need to really focus on making a good company. And it's not like we can't forever make the products. Uh, we want to provide a company where people can do amazing things, where they can be creative, where they're valued, they're trusted to, to experiment, to make mistakes. And we just really wanted to create an environment where that could happen so it wasn't on us. Uh, so culture is super important to us, but I think a lot of times people get culture wrong. It's like, oh, you have beer on tap and ping pong tables and foosball and you have VR rooms and arcades and massage chairs. Those are all perks and they're nice. Culture is an environment where you can do your best work, like where you where you, um, where you you feel valued. When, when your leadership is away, you make the same decisions they would if they were there. You don't do things because of a policy. You have deep-rooted principles yeah. that um, you can you and that's that's like a strong culture. Yeah. It's almost like a tribe yeah. that like there is, doesn't have to be a policy book for something. It's just this is our values. So um, we've been very intentional with with our culture, uh, not because it'll happen whether you want it to or not. Yeah. And if you're not intentional with it, it it could be a bad culture. Yeah. But every company will have a culture. So um, it just, seems to go back to the hiring process and kind of hiring for your values. Yes. 
So what, what are some of the values that you hire for? Sure. Uh, so we actually, it's funny you asked this question because we spent a lot of time thinking about this. So we, we um, and if you Google the bold builders code, a couple years ago we sat down for three days, we surveyed all of our staff, we asked everyone, um, why do you like coming to work? What makes you happy? What makes you like not happy? How do you do your most, where do you do your most creative work? What inspires you? Um, it was like a list of like 40 questions. Yeah. We asked what every staff. What people say about not happy and happy? What what uh, things that surprised you? Anything that sticks out? Well, actually, so one, yeah, there was a lot. One of the ones that really stuck out for me was we asked, uh, where do you do your best work? Um, and so there's a lot of uh, push for like open it's concept. It's obviously the toilet because that's why that yeah, app was created. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what one of the common uh, answers was, was uh, sometimes I have to go home to get my work done. Because like, it's, it's, there's a lot of distractions at the office and it's open concept and people are like, there's music or they're talking and it's fun. But when you really got to work, and then there's the other side of it where if, you, if you're traveling, you're at a show like this, you might find yourself one day uh, in your hotel room that you just wrote the most creative blog post you've ever written. Or you're at a Starbucks and you're like, why, why can't you do that at, at your desk? Well, you need a change of scenery. Yeah. You need, That's an interesting you, question in general. Mm -hmm. So all of these questions, we built our what we call our, our builder's code, which is a, it's about a 60 page deck and it's, it's online, we open sourced it. And uh, some other companies have actually said, oh, we're, we're gonna use this for ourselves. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's just a list of everything we value, uh, why we value principles, not policies, how we make judgment, uh, how we like, you know, like if we have to decide something, it's the customer is greater than the team, the team is greater than the individual. So every decision aligns that way. And then the reason we call it the builder's code is we looked at about the, the first 20 people we hired and every single one of them is still with Bold. And they all, you know, none of them, when they started, said, oh, when do my benefits kick in? And when is, like, we never had catered lunches. We never had any perks. It's before you had all the fancy perks. When we needed to open a new office, they came with their hammer and nails and they said, I'm going to help build it. So they were builders. And that's what, like, we wanted, even now that we're, you know, 200 something, we want that same mindset. So we came up with, like, we, we tried to determine what are all the attributes that make someone a builder. And then we actually fit it into the name. So uh, it's to belong innovate, understand, learn, deliver, elevate, respect, and support. Each one of these we have like a lot of, it's like we expand out on it. And then we work that into every aspect of our culture. Yeah. So our one-on-ones uh, are all built around the builder's code. Our annual reviews we call builder reviews. When we do wall of wow cards every Friday, someone writes like something someone awesome did. On the, on the card, you circle which letter that it represents. So, mm. so if it I'm like, forces people talking. About yeah, like culture. if you did something awesome this week, you really nailed it. You got that project done. I would circle D for deliver. Like you, you, you busted it and you got it done. Or maybe it's like, you know what? You really helped me this week. I was struggling, and you really you came and you like encouraged me, and that would be elevate. It's like you helped me elevate, right? And so actually, one of the hack day projects was uh, one of our <laughs> developers is building this out to be. Uh, digitized so like you'll have like superpowers in your B and like you can see which ones you rank like you might be super good on the innovative but not as good on delivering right. or you know what I mean so um, so we like try personality test you yeah like when you have internal like internal bold personality test yeah maybe we'll make like player cards and this is be your like your powers but uh, so so we hire what we say we hire for personality not for skill um, you can teach skill but you can't teach personality and like you know we, we believe Good teams win Super Bowls, not good players. So you, you can have the best player on a team, but they won't win a Super Bowl. If you have the, a good team, they win. Uh, so we, when we hire, we always try to think, like, how will this person enhance the team? Not are they the best at every line item on the resume. Right. It's like how will they help? Totally. Like, will they you be good? You look at the best teams, and you see there's, there's a lot of role players, you know? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to your your core team, right? So how did you meet or know your co-founders? Sure. Um, so there's four of us. Um, I played, so Steph, it's me, Steph, Eric, and Yvonne. Uh, I had known Steph for years, and one day uh, we were sitting at a pub in Winnipeg. I was telling him about this idea for this Shopify app. He had been in kind of the, he's a designer, and he had been in the e-commerce space designing e-commerce websites, not on Shopify, but just, you know, in the new e-commerce space. Um, and right away he said, oh, well, let's try it. I know these two other, like, really talented developers. Let's just go in the four of us. And honestly, it was like, let's see if we can make some beer money and take our wives on vacation once a year. That was, that was our goal. 
Um, so that was why we picked, we're like, well, what's the easiest app we can build? And we thought, well, oh, an upsell app is easy. And like, we always laugh because we're Famous still, word, we're still right. developing that one. But um, so, so Ivan uh, is, we actually, I, I did know him from a long time ago. I had met him like 10 years ago, but we, we had kind of lost touch, but so obviously we reconnected now. We played volleyball in university together. Uh, and Eric is his brother, so they're brothers. So that was how the four of us, and it was a really actually a perfect mix because uh, Ivan and Eric are product, like developer, really good product minds. Very technical. Yeah, Eric is very technical. Ivan has a very strong product mind. Uh, Steph is a designer, and yeah, I like sales. sales, marketing, business development. So like the four of us, like it would have been hard if I just started the company by myself, we bold would not be what it is today, but the four of us together were able to really, um, it was, it was really like pieces of a puzzle. And I think that that was like, I, I don't know if I would, I think it would be hard to do a partnership because you know, it's always like it's 50, 50 and you can't like, if you have to make a decision, but four, it's interesting because there's a lot of times I'm not right about something and um, you know, we'll discuss things and it, maybe it, it doesn't uh, go the way that I think is the best, but I I'd say, okay, it, our, our goal is to always get to the best decision. It doesn't have to be my decision or it doesn't have to be someone else's. It's what's the best for the company. And uh, when you're four people, that it's 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 fine. If it's like always two, it's hard. So uh, I, I'm a big proponent for multiple founders. Um, uh, yeah. So it's it's been. I think that's been one of the, our keys is to have four dedicated people since day one. If I had to hire people uh, and be like, I want you to care about this company, like it's like your livelihood and. I, you wouldn't have got that same dedication. Is there so. something, Jason, unique about the interview process that allows you to hire for these values? You know, like, you know, yeah. you think of, I think of like Zappos, yeah. they're taking you and, and the person driving is really starting the interview right yeah. then to see how nice the person is. I don't know if there's anything interesting about your, your interview process as you've, you've really grown a lot. Um, the, I would say we don't do a ton different, but the one thing we do different is we make sure that there's always multiple people in it and one person is really making sure that like that the 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 t's They're are crossed and the, different things yeah so one person from the hr team is like dotting the i's and crossing the t's they do the background checks they do like so that the person who's talking doesn't have to look at the resume it's like if i'm interviewing you you qualify. I'm not going to sit there and look at this bullet point on your resume. Okay, tell me about your experience at this company seven years ago. I don't care about that. I care about like you as a person. I've 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 looked at the resume. That that all checks out. Now we can like put that aside and just talk. Um, so I don't know how different that is, but it allows us to not yeah. let the resume lead the, con the the direction of the conversation and just like the the oh. interaction. So um, you know that's that's been helpful and. Yeah. I think it's <clears throat> it's still a, um, an evolution. Like we're still working on improving it. Uh, a, as we grow, that might change. And I, I I've actually like so I know the Zappos process. Um, Shopify actually has a really cool process. They don't call it an interview. They call it a life story. So when you go there, it's just like, hey, tell us the story of your life. Mm -hmm. And what what they look for, and we look for the same thing too. We don't call it a life story, but they look for people that do really interesting things. So like when you were in high school, did you? start the club that built like radios that they ended up getting used did you like those hackers those guys right. that the guys that are going to build cool projects on our hackathons we listen for things like that like as they're like talking like oh tell us about like college what did you do and then you hear oh well like what were you passionate passion's a big one like you can get that out if they're talking about something right. they built or Maybe did they love video games or something that comes right up. it's not the person who likes to donate for charities it's like the guy who oh actually i built an app that helps run the charity program and like so you could donate through this like okay that's cool that's like and they, he did it on his own time and that's like that's going to be someone that fits in really good at bold jason before we started you were saying there's i think six pillars or six core things of what you look at to build an app i don't know if the number was six but what were you referring to yeah so um, this is a bit of a transition we're going through now as a company. Uh, we have, I think, 24 public apps. We have hundreds of private apps. Like we, we build apps for merchants that like don't go in the app store. They're just one-offs. Um, and so we have a lot of tools. And over the last year, we've really started to think about like what problems are we solving for merchants? Like what are we when a merchant merchants think problem first? They don't think what software. It's like I. Want, I need to run a subscription business. So that's that's their problem. 
So that's actually so that's one of our solution pillars. Is, is it is subscriptions underneath that are a few different apps so we have a subscriptions app but we also have a membership app we also have a uh, smart subscriptions app and it's so that's not just an app it's a it's a suite of apps plus services that if you want to run a successful subscription business we can help you with that and then it's for um, wholesale and b2b is another one of our solutions uh, customization which is really that's a big trend in e-commerce is like everyone wants to customize their products. So like if you buy Nike shoes, you can you can customize your Nike shoes on Nike. You don't have to buy the ones that are on there. Um, so we have a suite of tools that help with that. We have partners, we have a service team, and that's our focus is how can we solve customization. Um, personalization is is um, giving a unique experience to shoppers as they get to your website. So actually the brain does a lot for right. that too. Um, so wholesale, B2B, Subscriptions, customization, personalization, actually they're right behind me here. Uh, pay, payment experience. Payment experience is um, really looking at everything that happens in the checkout process. Yeah. Uh, and just, because that's one of the biggest places you lose customers. Um, what is uh, the, is there a figure out there that is a standard for like, this is a typical abandonment? Uh, in For card for, abandonment? I've so heard I, various things. I mean, I've heard is like could be, you know, 95%. I don't know yeah. how accurate that is. Well, it depends on which at which point you're looking at it. So like in the actual checkout, like if someone gets to the checkout, um, it's still about 40%. If you're looking at like card abandonment before they get to the checkout, it's like 70%. If you look at card abandonment like when they land on your website and just added a product but haven't even gone to the cart. So it get it gets right. it gets progressively lower the further the deeper in the right. in the funnel they are. Um, but I think so I think part of it's a bit of a skewed number. So card abandonment globally in checkout uh, ranges from 40 to some sites say 70%. But a big factor of that is people add things to the cart, go to checkout to see what the shipping costs. They want to know, do they ship here and how much is shipping going to cost? So you can right away eliminate that by having shipping estimates or pricing up front, showing it on product pages. Like uh, you can you can detect through their I, like IP address where they're from. So like shipping to your place is going to be two to three days, and roughly this. So like those abandons in the checkout aren't necessarily people abandoning the checkout. Uh, also, everyone knows that if you add something to the cart, put in your email address and leave, you'll get an email two hours later from an abandoned cart email saying, "Hey, we noticed you left this. Here's a 10% off coupon." So everyone's gaming it. Um, so the numbers are skewed. So when I look at like abandonment, I would be like, okay, if you can strip out people that just want to know shipping and then strip out people that go to the checkout and then end up using, because the abandoned cart emails say, yeah, we recover 50%. Did you recover them or did they just use your email to get 10% off? So it's 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 a skewed. It's biased. Yeah, yeah. so it's hard to get a real number. Um, but it, I mean, if you once you strip out all of that, it's still high. It's still probably like 20%. Yeah. So anyways, so, back to the payment experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you help make that more of a frictionless process. Yeah, so anything from like every aspect of how you pay. So whether you want to do um, time payments, pre-orders, like proper pre-orders where you're not, like a lot of stores do pre-orders but they actually charge the credit card. Shouldn't do that. Like what if the product comes in three months later, you don't want to be sitting on their money. If you're a publicly traded company, you are not allowed to do that. Um, so uh, friend buy, which is kind of a cool thing. We're actually working on this right now. Like if you want to be able to buy uh, gifts, say you're buying something for a family member and it's uh, 500 bucks and you want to split the payment with your brother, you pay half, click a button, it sends them a link. Oh, that's cool. They can pay half. When, when they pay, it completes the order. Um, Multi-currency is a, you know, a, a payment experience thing, so being able to bill in any currency that, that where they are. Um, upselling after checkout, what else is during the payment experience? A multi-credit card, so like, um, there's a few big companies like airlines that do this, so you can put as you're checking out, say I want to put 300 on this credit card and 200 on this, so allowing multiple forms of payment on one checkout. So every aspect of the payment experience, just looking at how can we make that better, um, how can we make it faster. So that's so that that's like a suite of like time payments is an app just by itself. But we look at it like okay, everything about the payment experience is a solution. So um, so that's been a change of focus for us. We're like. And now all of our decisions, when it's like, what app should we build? Does it fall under one of one these of solutions? Those, those solutions, yeah. If it doesn't, then it doesn't fit our roadmap. So, so last question, Jason. This is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, what's been just a proud moment from the journey for you? A mm. proud milestone? I, honestly, I think this, the proudest thing for me is when, when um, like we've had since we started the company about like 40, maybe it, it's more now, I counted recently, 40 of our staff buy their first home. Um, you know, people who've decided they could now get married and have kids, but they couldn't before. And like when I see people planting roots and it's they it's because of the, the company, like to me, that's honestly like I'm, I'm super proud that we're helping merchants like that's but like I, I guess it's because I see our staff every day and I see right. I don't get unfortunately I don't get to see the merchants every day. So I'm just really close to staff. And when I see someone who is now able to do something with their life because they work at Bold, like that's that really makes me proud. So I know that's unrelated to yeah. e-commerce, e but it's it's a personal. No, yeah. It starts with the team first because if it weren't that core team building all the stuff, then people wouldn't be able to use the apps and yeah. you know sell more essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where can people find you? Where should they go online? Uh, we're boldcommerce.com. Uh, myself, I'm on Twitter at uh, Jason N Myers, um, but our our company profile is bold underscore commerce. But really, just our website boldcommerce.com, and everything is there. And, yep. uh, the largest Shopify app, and you guys make other apps too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So check out Bold Commerce and uh, Jason. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Like a beach if you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand